The Out of the Lab podcast is a production of the John F. Green Spartanburg Science Center. The Spartanburg Science Center is a 501c3 nonprofit located in Spartanburg, South Carolina. For the past 40 years, the Science Center has been dedicated to exciting, engaging, and educating the local community. The Out of the Lab podcast was made possible by two grants, one from AFL for studio equipment and one from Contech Inc. for the studio space. The Out of the Lab podcast is hosted by me, Grayson McDowell, and I couldn't do it without the support of Mary Levins, executive director, and my friend Charlie Yang, who works behind the scenes. Most importantly, thank you for listening to the podcast and supporting STEM education. If you would like to donate to the Spartanburg Science Center, you can go to our website, spartanburgsciencecenter.org. That's spartanburgsciencecenter.org. So uh, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Uh, I, today I am here with Dr. Aaron Garrett. Dr. Aaron Garrett is an assistant professor and chair of the computer science department at Wofford. And he got his uh, bachelor's of science in math at Jacksonville State University in 1999. He got his master's of computer science and software design in 2002 at Jacksonville State as well. And you also got your PhD in ComSci in 2008. Now, did you also get that at Jacksonville? No. Auburn. Auburn. University. That's right. Um, and his PhD thesis was on evolutionary computation, right. um, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. Um, he's originally from Gadsden, Alabama, which is close to Birmingham. And he has a wife, a 14-year-old son, and an 11-year-old daughter. Um, so uh, Dr. Garrett. Uh, thank you for being here. Of course. And uh, so I would just like to start with what got you interested in computer science in the first place? Were you born to be mm -hmm. in computer science? Was there a subject that interested you first that sort of led you into computer science? Um, I was not interested in computer science. Well, it wasn't like computers were a uh, ubiquity like they are now oh, when okay. I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, not uh, so when I mean the internet wasn't a thing when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Most people didn't have computers in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I graduated high school in 1995, so that Windows 95 mm -hmm. was just a thing. Um, when I was when I was finishing my math degree, one of the math faculty uh, had said, you really need to take a, a programming class oh. because that's going to be important in the future. Okay. Um, and this, this was a, a guy who never wanted to interact with computers ever, but he still could recognize mm. that it was going to be important. So my, um, my last... I, maybe my last semester, I took uh, a computer science class, programming. Uh, no, the fall of my senior year, I took I took a computer science class in basic programming, and I really liked it. And I thought, oh, this I didn't know this was even a thing you could do. Mm. So my last semester, I took another computer science course, and I still liked it. It didn't go away. And so then I thought maybe I should see about continuing a, a degree in this mm -hmm. thing that I like. Mm -hmm. So that's why I stayed around and, and did a, a master's degree just to deepen my understanding of computer science. That also meant that I had to take some sort of remedial undergraduate courses because I had none. Right? I had two mm -hmm. undergraduate courses that were fairly basic. Um, and yeah, that was it. I say all that, though, when I was a kid, um, one particular Christmas, uh, my parents, as my Christmas present, got me a, a Tandy Color computer, <laughs> uh, which was, uh, if I showed it to you now, it looks like a keyboard with a sort of wide back on the keyboard. And that was the computer. You would plug that in, and you would attach it to your TV in the same way that I would attach my Atari oh. to my TV. You would attach it 
and mm -hmm. the TV would be the monitor, mm -hmm. and you would have this computer. And I don't ever remember asking for a computer, mm -hmm. and I don't really remember thinking, yay, thank you for this present. <laughs> it was kind of like uh, in Ferris Bueller when he says <laughs> that his sister got a car mm -hmm. and he got a computer, mm -hmm. and he was very like disappointed about that. I wasn't disappointed. It's just I don't remember wanting it. <laughs> they just thought I would like it. Uh, okay. So I got this, I got this thing mm -hmm. and um, I had resigned myself. Okay, well, this is mine now. I guess mm -hmm. I will read the instructions for it. So it came with this big instruction manual for the computer and I would just read the instruction manual trying to understand what I could do with this present that I didn't exactly want and mm -hmm. now I have. And only many, many years later mm -hmm. did I understand what that instruction manual was. It was actually a programming manual oh. to learn how to program in BASIC, which wow. is a, a language that the computer understood. Oh, okay. So I was actually reading a, a how to program book. Oh. I thought it was the instructions for the computer, which it, technically it is, but mm -hmm. I thought it was like an instruction manual on how to use your computer, not hmm. how to give instructions to your computer, which is what it actually was. Okay. So uh, I essentially learned how to program. Didn't know it at the time. and. So maybe some of that helped me when I saw mm -hmm. this idea later on, um, but it definitely helped me when I would go to my uh, elementary school classes because there were always the um, Apple IIe computers, mm. the ones that people my age would remember playing Oregon Trail on. Uh, so every classroom had one of those computers because they were given to the schools. And those computers uh, could also understand BASIC. So I could go in there and say, ooh, watch this. And I could, <laughs> I could write a little program that, that printed infinitely, like hello or something like that. <laughs> or had little conditionals like, uh, what is your name? And they would say, my name is Tommy. And it's like, you, you're no good, Tommy. And then it's like, my name is Josh. Like, yeah, you're great, Josh. So I could like customize it uh, for whoever was entering things. I don't know. For, for, for a brief moment in time, I was super cool because I could do that. Oh, anyway. okay. That's cool. So, so that is my that was my uh, experience with computers prior to graduate school. Okay, um, and so in graduate school, mm -hmm. how did you um, did it? Was evolutionary computation even a thing? How did you? It get was okay. Um, so, um, how did I get involved with that? That was that was of interest to me. Um, early on and I specifically chose um, a school and an advisor that did that thing as most people do when they go to grad school or if you're going to go uh, get a PhD usually you try to find someone that matches your interests because that person is very important in your life for the next five <laughs> to seven years so oh, yeah. it, it's, it's a long-term relationship. You want to make sure mm. that you get it right. So I, um, my, my advisor in, at Auburn was um, Jerry Dozier, and that's what he does, evolutionary computation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wide field, though. It's a mm -hmm. subfield of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe I should explain what it is before I go on. Yeah. Uh, so evolutionary computation is where you, you simulate the biological process of evolution mm -hmm. uh, within a program because the biological evolution is very good at optimizing mm -hmm. a creature for its environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, if the environment changes, the creature may no longer be optimal, mm -hmm. right? They may not be best at cracking these particular nuts. Yeah, like uh, the dinosaurs. Sure. Yeah. Their, their environment changed dramatically all yes. at once, though. Yes, this is true. Um, so, Maybe a bad example. So in, in, the, uh, in evolutionary computation, mm -hmm. you take that idea mm -hmm. and you model... Usually, you're trying to solve some problem that is an optimization problem. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we want to make a we make a particular product mm -hmm. that is the 
most resistant mm -hmm. to uh, bending, mm -hmm. right? Or we want to make uh, airplane wings that are the most structurally sound mm -hmm. as well as the lightest that we can make them. Mm -hmm. So you model whatever it is you're trying to do uh, by uh, letting some some variables stand in for the things that you are trying to find the optimal values for. So it's sort of okay. like you, you have dials that you can turn. Mm -hmm. If I if I make the um, let me let me say a specific problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me yeah. let me give you a specific problem. So this would be easy to understand, I think. At some point, uh, my my advisor and I were working with the with the um, engineering school. Oh. Okay. Because uh, some of in at Auburn, the computer science is in the College of Engineering, so it's we're all together. But we were working with engineers. Hmm. Uh, about that they were safety engineers mm -hmm. and we wanted to um, try to determine where best the exits in a building should be located hmm. so that people could in the event of an emergency escape most uh, quickly and safely oh that's interesting so um, you know, if we modeled that, mm -hmm. if we say instead of a building we're talking about a room mm -hmm. we model the room as a rectangle suppose mm -hmm. Um, and then we want to find out where the doors should be placed. Mm -hmm. So you could think of the position of the doors uh, l to make the problem simpler. Let's suppose that we have four doors that we'd like to put in, mm -hmm. the, in the place. Uh, so the position of each of the four doors becomes a variable that we're trying to find the right values for. Mm -hmm. um, and so we essentially make little... Uh, I don't know how to describe this. Uh, I, I want to say vectors. Yeah. No, yeah, you yeah, understand yeah. that concept. But so we, we basically just make uh, uh, multiple uh, four number mm -hmm. uh, lists mm -hmm. where the four numbers are all different in each mm -hmm. one. And that becomes sort of like our, our genome, our DNA mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. particular individual. It's mm -hmm. those four numbers. For a different individual, it's a different four numbers. Oh, okay. And then we take those four numbers for each individual, mm -hmm. turn it into a room mm -hmm. with the doors in that unique position, mm -hmm. and then we put people in the room, people, mm -hmm. by people we're modeling them as, say, circles. Yes. And those circles move about, trying to get out the closest door. Oh. And if the circles push too closely to each other because they're all getting jammed into a corner and mm -hmm. they overlap too much, we would say that they were injured because right? mm. they were crushed. Yeah. So we count up how many circles escaped, how mm -hmm. many were injured, and uh, how many didn't escape. Mm -hmm. um, and we use that to determine how good that individual was. Mm -hmm. um, and then, the, then we will take the best, mm -hmm. the better individuals, and we will let them um, cross over mm -hmm. with some of the other individuals. So it's sort of like they're mating. Okay. And they produce... Yeah. Uh, another individual different a child mm -hmm. that has different numbers but it's mm -hmm. similar to the parents mm -hmm. and then uh, we would let that child have a room and be mm -hmm. assessed be evaluated for its fitness is what I would say right. in yeah. normal language mm -hmm. um, and if you let that run for a little while you mm -hmm. end up getting um, quite good door placements because that, that's that's right. just the same process as the biological evolution would go through. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I find biological evolution so fascinating. Um, so there are some misconceptions about it, though, that I guess I could address. Like, like when we say fitness, we're not talking about um, what people do in the gym. We're talking about how an individual, how well an individual fits into the environment, right? And um, so like this term survival of the fittest that comes from like Darwin's uh, 19th century English, right? So um, what would you, what is the, like the analog to an individual not fitting into the environment, like, like being removed from the population, let's say, because, sure, yeah. So 
Um, n now that I, I think we're, we're clear on what these individuals look like, they're really right. just vectors of numbers, just right. lists of numbers. Yeah. Um, in this particular problem, they can be all kinds of things, but in my particular simple problem mm -hmm. that I've outlined, these are just lists of numbers. Um, and you start with a population, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bunch of those lists mm -hmm. randomly generated. Um, and y from that population, mm -hmm. you let's call it embody each of those uh, individuals into a room and then mm -hmm. you and you process the room mm -hmm. and now you have a fitness value for them you know mm -hmm. how good they are okay. um, mm -hmm. and so we do that for the entire population mm -hmm. and then once we know the fitness values for each of the individuals mm -hmm. uh, you select mm -hmm. some of them to be parents mm -hmm. so how do we select them to be parents there's many many ways mm -hmm. what you don't want to do um, you have to be careful because if you do the what seems like might be a good idea mm -hmm. of we should take the best ones hmm. the best ones in the population should be the parents if you do that then the two best individuals in the population mm -hmm. you will use to make a bunch of offspring so if we had a hundred things in our population to begin mm -hmm. with we take the top two mm -hmm. and they create 98 kids let's mm -hmm. say and now those two and their 98 kids are in the next generation. Mm -hmm. And then you run them and see what's better. And then you take the top two. Um, so, so how are things getting eliminated? Mm -hmm. In this case, we're eliminating them because if they didn't make it to be parents, mm -hmm. they, they die off. Okay. And only the parents and the kids. But that's not a good idea. That oh, actually okay. would give you quite bad results. Mm -hmm. Because if I think about... Um, if I picture in my mind what I'm trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. I'm trying, I have a, I have a sort of a landscape mm -hmm. um, where every point on this, this hilly mountainous landscape mm -hmm. is a particular individual, is a particular mm -hmm. location for the doors. So every point is a location for the doors. Mm -hmm. And the, the goodness of that location, right, mm -hmm. how, how efficiently people can escape is sort of the height on okay. the landscape, right? Mm -hmm. And what I would love to find is the top of the tallest mountain. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the optimal one, right, the top of the tallest mountain. If I do what I described to you and just let the, just let the, the two best constantly mm -hmm. create offspring and those are the only ones that make it, what I will end up doing is finding the top of some little peak somewhere hmm. and the, the, the top of the tallest mountain is, is maybe not even near there. Mm. I just find the top of a hill mm -hmm. and nowhere around the hill is better than the top of it. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, I must be at the best place ever. Mm -hmm. But no, I'm just at the best place right here. There's a way better place over there, but you can't see it because mm -hmm. you've, you've limited in biological evolution we would say that you, you've lost diversity, mm. right? You need genetic mm. diversity or otherwise you're going to, um, in the language of both biological evolution and evolutionary computation, we would say you've prematurely converged mm -hmm. to a solution. Uh, right? okay. That's not the best solution. It's called a locally optimal solution. Mm -hmm. The top of a hill, not the top of the mountain that you're looking for. Mm. So that's no good. What you would instead rather do is make sure that there's always a chance to let a less fit individual become a parent and also survive. So one easy way to do that, that's pretty easy to explain, is rather than only letting the two best individuals mm -hmm. uh, produce offspring, instead you run tournaments. So if I have 100, hmm. if I have 100 individuals, I assess them all so I know what the, all their fitness values mm -hmm. are, and then I randomly pick some number of them Mm -hmm. as my tournament mm -hmm. so maybe I randomly pick five mm -hmm. and I say who is the best in these five and whoever the best is you become a parent I randomly pick five if they may be some from this is with replacement so there may be mm -hmm. some that I've already picked maybe new ones who knows and I say who's the best in this okay you become uh, you become a parent okay so I, I pick so many that way and then there's a chance that even lesser fit individuals can still become parents because mm -hmm. only if they happen to be selected in a tournament where the best individual is would they be beaten. 
Okay. Right. So there's opportunities. Right. And um, so, so that's how you can kind of maintain diversity. Okay, so what I'm picturing here is something like a March Madness bracket where each game has like five teams. Is that? It, it is, except that um, in, you know, in March Madness, a, a <laughs> team is eliminated. Right. But here, it, it's as if we're running uh, a, a lot of different tournaments where you could be picked for multiple tournaments. Okay. Uh, but it's the same idea though, right? So I just, I, I pick a bunch of people and I see who's <laughs> the best in my hand. <laughs> Right, and whoever that is, I let them go. Then I throw everybody back in the bucket. I pick out another handful. Okay. Who's the best in my hand? You get to go. I throw them all back in the bucket, okay. and I continue to do that until I filled up however many parents I'm trying to get, mm. and then they can produce offspring, and then usually mm -hmm. um, they will produce enough offspring to to make an entire new generation, mm -hmm. and then we just throw the parents away. We hmm. usually wouldn't let them stay around. Sometimes we'll let the very best parent stay around mm -hmm. because they, they are the best and you don't want to necessarily lose that. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes we'll just throw them all away and it's only mm -hmm. the kids because the parents sort of die off and the kids are the next generation. And then you run mm -hmm. the same thing again and you just repeat that mm -hmm. uh, as long as you have time to do it or until they quit getting any better mm -hmm. because at some point it will converge mm -hmm. to some solution. And um, the, the hope is that it converges something more optimally. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the, so it's not like biological evolution in the sense that you, you actually reach an end point. You actually reach an end point where you have the best model. Is that right? Where you have, well, at least like a max, right? Like an absolute max or um, the most optimal. Well, usually you don't know. Okay. Right, because usually you're solving a problem where if you knew what the max was, you would just you wouldn't need to run this this task right and um, just in case uh, someone is thinking wait if I want to optimize something mm -hmm. so I can imagine someone might think this if I want to optimize something mm -hmm. then I know because I had a class in calculus mm -hmm. that if I could take some derivatives mm -hmm. then I could find some optimal value right and I don't disagree with that mm -hmm. if you can write down the function you are trying to optimize mm. in a formula. Mm -hmm. If I can write it down, then you don't, well, you, you don't really need to use this, this approach. Right, okay. Because you can just use your tools from calculus okay. and, and find the optimal that way. But what would your function be in my escape the room example? How would you write that down as maybe yeah. we could do it as a, as a system of differential equations or something, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, but then again, if you have a system of differential equations, you can't really solve those mm -hmm. usually either, right? You have, mm -hmm. to, you have to sort of um, numerically try to get a handle on what's going on. Mm -hmm. So um, usually you can't write these things down. They're just it's too, too complicated. It doesn't, doesn't fit neatly into that uh, make a function out of it and then run your, uh, do your calculus techniques. Right. So this is, a, this is a solution when that won't work. Mm -hmm. And most of the time in, let, what I would say, most of the time in real life, yeah. that's what you run into. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, the, in, in, in biological evolution, you were saying there's an end to, to this task. Mm -hmm. There's an end because you simply have, have lost, you, you've run out of time, right? Usually okay. you're trying to solve this engineering problem and you can't wait forever. Right. And even if you did continue to wait, y you will eventually lose the diversity in your population. Mm. What you could do is you could periodically just in inject random solutions mm -hmm. and see if they pull you somewhere else. Um, but uh, biological evolution doesn't end because things continue to persist, right? Nobody turned off the system. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this approach, you, you eventually just say, okay, this is enough. We're mm -hmm. close enough. Um, also, a, a thing most of the time in, in these cases, which is not true for biological evolution, the... Um, the fitness landscape that I was mm -hmm. talking about, the mm -hmm. mountain that you're trying to find the peak of, um, that is very, that, that is um, constant. That is, stays the same all the time. Mm -hmm. 
So a good solution today mm -hmm. is a good solution tomorrow is a good solution always because the fitness landscape is always the same. In biological evolution, mm -hmm. it's not, right? right? Things mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now that it's uh, one degree hotter, mm -hmm. some organisms will not survive. Mm -hmm. They would have been fine before, but now they will not be fine. And so now something else can take over that particular niche or whatever. So there's a, there's a, um, a moving landscape mm -hmm. in biological evolution okay. that you normally don't have here. All right, cool. Um, also, uh, it sounded, I wanted to comment, it sounded, this almost sounds, um, well, I know most people when they think about what, what computers can do, they almost always think that of some sort of endpoint or that there is hmm. something, there's just, there's some sort of problem, like, you know, almost like a Rubik's cube mm -hmm. that, and the uh, computer originally, uh, eventually reaches an endpoint, solves the Rubik's cube or solves the puzzle, right? Sure. Um, so, but this sounds a little bit more like engineering almost in a sense, in the sense that it's less, um, it's less theoretical. The puzzle is not so well um, defined. You're using more of a modeling technique, or maybe even using uh, what sounds, it, seem, it seems like there's a little bit more of an artistic flair to this as well, or, or like you're injecting stuff in and That's taking right. stuff out. Yeah, I, I would like to say that there is a, a clear method to the science. Right. But there, you do have to be s creative usually mm -hmm. um, because, um, I mean, there's, you, you have to first model your problem. Mm -hmm. What problem are you trying to solve and how are you going to evaluate uh, fitness values mm -hmm. and hand in hand with that question is how am I going to represent my my individuals mm. how am I going to so we have two representations mm -hmm. I should I guess I should use these words so we have the representation of the list of numbers mm -hmm. and let's let me call that the genotype like mm -hmm. the DNA mm -hmm. that's your uh, A, C's, G's and T's right in your your um, your bases yep. in your DNA. So that's what my list of numbers is. But then there's the, the individual, the, the mm -hmm. creature mm -hmm. that those encode the instructions for. And that is like me and you and, and uh, a rabbit, right? Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a real uh, embodied thing. And that embodied thing is what is then evaluated in the environment, right? The environment is not directly mm -hmm. evaluating my DNA. It's evaluating the DNA's instructions that were built mm. and then I go and find food and whatever. Okay. Yeah. So let's call that embodiment the phenotype. Mm -hmm. P-H-E-N-O. Mm -hmm. Phenotype. So uh, you have to decide how you're going to model the genotype. How are you going to model the phenotype? How are you going to turn that into something you can then mm -hmm. evaluate for fitness? Mm -hmm. So those are three things, right? The genotype, the phenotype, the fitness calculation. Mm -hmm. You have to figure all that out, and, they, and they're related to each other. Uh, and once I know what my genotypes will be, mm -hmm. how will I let two different uh, solutions, uh, two different genotypes, mm -hmm. mate? Hmm. How am I going to combine yeah. them to produce offspring? And if I combine them in some ways, maybe most of the offspring are no longer viable. You mm -hmm. could have constraints that make that be maybe this this particular list of numbers doesn't mm -hmm. even make any sense mm -hmm. if I tried to put it into a room or put it into a body. So, um, the, so there's no prescription for any of that. You just have mm -hmm. to come up with it as you go and make sure that things make sense and mm -hmm. then you look at your results and you may go back and scrap some ideas because it just didn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. Um, also, uh, it sounds like a lot of this takes a lot of computing power. Um, mm. So, uh, is it fair to say it, it, some of your work has taken place on what we might call a supercomputer, or are they just like, are they, are they not just like computers you can buy at Best Buy, right? Or Sure. So, um, you, you could do this on your computer at home. It's, okay. I mean, but it, the, the, the benefit of doing an approach like, mm -hmm. like uh, what I've described is I could have a population of uh, 100,000 individuals mm -hmm. 
And if I do have access mm -hmm. to um, a lot of computing resources, a supercomputer mm -hmm. or many, many cores um, or a network of computers that I could leverage, whatever, then I could take uh, those individuals and throw them all out into those computational resources mm. at the same time oh. because they don't interact with each other when they're being evaluated. Mm. And the evaluation is almost always the most expensive part of the thing, the most time consuming mm. part of the task. Hmm. All the other stuff about them having children and selecting and dying off, that is really fast. The evaluation is almost always very slow in comparison. Mm. So the fact that I can put do that all in parallel mm. makes it really powerful. So yes, you take your population, then you throw it out into whatever computing resources you have. Mm. They all come back, mm. and then you, on on uh, a single th thread, mm -hmm. you you process the population and, and get rid of individuals and let the kids move on, and then you throw them out again. And they come back, you do a very quick process, you throw them out again, right? So uh, I very regularly have problems where on your computer at home, just processing one fitness calculation for one individual might take several minutes. Mm. Um, so if you wanted to process a thousand of those, you're talking about thousands of minutes, right? You've done that most of a day, mm. more than a day. So, um, so, uh, at that point, um, you would you would benefit from having lots of resources, mm -hmm. so that I if I had a thousand computers mm -hmm. or something that was the same as that, mm -hmm. I could take all those individuals, throw them out to the thousand of computers, mm -hmm. and then in a few minutes I would get all of them back. So something that would have taken days and days now I just a few minutes, but lots of computers, right? So I can spread I can. Uh, spread the the time requirement across mm. space. Nice to yeah. make it to make it faster. Mm. Okay, okay, so that makes sense. Um, let me see. Uh, can I ask? Uh, so I know it's. Is there any sort of special process um, that you've gone through to get access to a supercomputer? Because I know from like from like a physics. From sure. my knowledge of like physics, if you wanted to, if you're an astronomer and you want to get a, access to a really high-powered telescope, then you have to. There's a process for it. You got to uh, apply for it and whatnot. And sure. So, uh, supercomputing resources. Uh, there, there is always an an application. Mm -hmm. um, usually, those resources are. Um, the applications are processed. They they usually don't cost you anything to mm -hmm. use them, um, but they're sort of uh, granted to you. Oh, and okay. so uh, the the one that I have used more often than not has been the um, the supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Labs okay. because much of my work uh, in the last five, ten years mm -hmm. has been um, with colleagues that work at Oak Ridge National Lab on energy modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we do work there, and they have um, supercomputing resources that they can apply for, mm -hmm. and so that's what we t typically use. But it is a, it is a uh, granted thing. So okay. you sort of apply for it, and they mm -hmm. say, yes, you get to have so many computing hours mm -hmm. on the, the thing. And, and that's all measured and clocked as you, as you run your stuff. So it's not like you have to keep up with it. The <laughs> system itself keeps up with how much you've used. Okay, cool. Um, uh, let me see. But, uh, yeah. So I would say um, uh, I don't usually need a supercomputer. Okay. I, it just makes my life better <laughs> because it, it will speed up my mm -hmm. wait time. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a supercomputer, it might take me a few weeks to complete some mm -hmm. particular experiment. And with a supercomputer, it might take mm -hmm. an hour. So it's not like I have to have it, but it is nice if, if it's available. Mm -hmm. But I can do a similar thing without spending too much money by just using cloud resources, right? So I can mm -hmm. use uh, Amazon Web Services to have uh, cloud computing, oh, and okay. I, can, I can create a sort of cloud computer with enough processors mm -hmm. so I can spread it out to speed it up to a day, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's not super expensive. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that if, if a project, if I need that, sure, I just do that. Okay. Um, all right. So um, it says here one of your two main interests is computational intelligence and artificial intelligence, and you've already said that evolutionary computation is one form of artificial intelligence. Um, mm -hmm. And we've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence on the show beforehand with Dr. Rachel Grother, who does some math, mm -hmm. uh, some sure. of the mathematics behind um, uh, some artificial intelligence research. Mm -hmm. um, for prediction, I presume. I... Uh, for, for data yeah. science, you want to predict yeah. something about your, your data, right? That, I, I, would I think so. I th um, I'll have to look back at the records and see. Sure. Um, what... Uh, what I'm interested in, and I think um, most people are interested in, is maybe just a quick take on what artificial intelligence is, what it's not, and um, uh, yeah, we'll start from there. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think artificial intelligence is uh, a very loaded word yes. that has become so overwrought as to be almost meaningless, <laughs> but it's still the word we use. Mm. So uh, a, a lot of people have gotten out of call of talking about artificial intelligence and they instead talk about machine learning. Okay. So you, you would you would hear that about as about as often now. You know, oh, we're gonna, this is a machine learning approach. Okay. Um, because artificial intelligence uh, has historically has some. Uh, some sci fi baggage, flavor. a lot of baggage oh, okay. with that term. So, um, so if, if, if we were going to talk about artificial intelligence approaches right now, mm -hmm. then uh, almost everything that you see is about deep learning. Mm. Uh, so, you will, you will often, if you read anything in the news about artificial intelligence, it's almost always about neural networks and deep learning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now, I, I don't exactly know what Dr. Grother was, was talking about, yeah. uh, but probably mm -hmm. something related to yeah. artificial neural networks and deep learning. Mm -hmm. So what is an artificial neural network? It is um, a, a simplified model of how neurons in our brains interact with one another to mm -hmm. process information. Um, and it can take many forms. Uh, without a whiteboard, I would be hard pressed to communicate this in words. Uh, but the, the idea is that uh, every neuron in, in my brain mm -hmm. is connected to a bunch of other neurons. Mm -hmm. And that neuron can receive signals from the other neurons that it's connected to. Mm -hmm. And it can send signals to those that it is connected to. Mm -hmm. And if you try to model that with a computer program, that is an artificial neural network. Some mm -hmm. so sort of a, a system that can kind of push information through and at the, uh, at the output, mm -hmm. you have some prediction or some, it can some categorization, mm -hmm. whatever it is you're trying to do. So, um, if, if I read about artificial intelligence approaches in, in the news, they're almost always doing something like that. Mm. But you'll, it's because the uh, self-driving cars mm -hmm. or image processing mm -hmm. or the, the idea of those deep fake videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's all. <laughs> or the, the, the fact that I have to constantly pick out the mailboxes in these series of pictures so that <laughs> Gmail will let me log on. Right? So, <laughs> I am not a robot. I can find all the mailboxes. <laughs> But the smarter that uh, these artificial approaches mm -hmm. get, I will have to find, they will have to give me other questions because mm. there will be a program that can find the mailboxes now. And mm. now I have to watch a video or something and tell it the, whatever's going on in the video. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't know what, what would be next mm -hmm. for those captions. <laughs> but uh, the, the smarter the artificial intelligence approaches get, the more it makes my life worse. <laughs> yeah, the more, the harder it is now for computers to verify that the user is actually a human rather than another computer. Right. Oh yeah. man. And so, you know, uh, 
Alan Turing uh, famously came mm-hmm. up with the, the, the Turing test to prove that a computer was a human, but we are now constantly having to prove the other thing that mm. this human is not a computer. <laughs> I have to constantly be proving to a computer that I am not a computer. And that's the, exactly yeah. the, the reverse of, of the Turing test. <laughs> I've, never, I've heard of the Turing test. I've never thought of it that way before. Oh, wow. Well. Um, so um, I've heard a little bit about, and there's, this is, I think this is the strangest stuff. I mean, when I hear about, like, when people think of, like, scary computer intelligence, this is the sort of thing they think about. They think about um, not just a computer being able to recognize an image um, because I think even, I think even Instagram does that now or mm. they have. Sure. And so, but, um, but a computer being like, for example, I saw, and you can tell me if this is fake, but it's, I saw um, that uh, Google's supercomputer was actually fed a bunch of images of um, some animal. I think it was a cat. And then they ask the computer to draw a picture of a cat um, based on all the images that it found. And that image was not just some other image that it had been fed. It was an image that the computer created somehow. Sure. Yeah. And so I think that's it's some people somehow think that is really scary because it seems like the computer can think now. Yeah, it seems like not. Only, it seems like it's being creative, like it's doing something that only humans can do, right? Right. So, um, okay. Um, computers being creative is one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, computers being super scary smart is a different thing. Mm-hmm. Computers being smart, like we believe ourselves to be, mm-hmm. is a third thing. Okay. Okay. So, can computers be creative? Yes. Uh, there's there's plenty of uh, uh, creative programs that can uh, compose music or write poetry or or create uh, visual art. Um, and in fact, there mm-hmm. there's a in evolutionary computation, there's a, a whole uh, conference devoted to these artistic uh, creative processes so that doesn't scare me if if at all (laughs) uh if they if they can be creative um you know being afraid of that sometimes sometimes an artist might uh might just uh pour paint into a fan and create some some canvas Mm -hmm. that's really good would we say that the fan is, is scary creative? <laughs> or are we saying that it's just sort of mm. f- following some rules and this is what pr- resulted? That's a good uh, analogy. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. Okay. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I, should, I should preface this with saying I'm not concerned about any of these things. Okay. I'm going to tell you why <laughs> I'm not concerned about any of them. So then the, uh, the computers being um, intelligent, mm-hmm. um, in their ability to recognize things. So mm. this thing could look at all these cats and come up with the concept of a cat and draw it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know exactly what was fed to the computer, mm-hmm. um, but if, if, it, if you gave me the task of making a program that could draw a, a cat based on all these cat pictures, um, I could take the this evolutionary approach that I described a minute ago and have mm. it do that, right? I could say, oh, wow. okay. decide. I could decide my genotype is where the lines will be, mm-hmm. or where the where the 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 points in the lines will be, mm-hmm. and then connect the lines in between them. I could make a whole population. I would I would put that thing in a phenotype by mm-hmm. drawing those lines, and then I would evaluate it by comparing that picture's lines to every cat picture and see how much they differed from all of them on average and the one that differed the least on average i would say that's the best one let's say this is just me spitballing an idea yeah 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 Yeah. okay so then (laughs) that thing would come back and it would give me probably something pretty decent that looked like a cat (laughs) do i think that this computer is is going to take over the world with that plan no (laughs) i had to make a whole lot of decisions for this thing Mm -hmm. um and however that thing works Mm -hmm. um 
the internal process is you feed information into the front mm -hmm. and eventually a cat picture pops out the back, mm -hmm. but it's not like the computer knows what a cat is. Okay. It just knows relationships between one image and another. Mm -hmm. it, it does not know what a cat is. That's why the computer is not smart like we think we are smart. Mm -hmm. We think we have, I keep saying we think we have, uh, we, we all believe mm -hmm. that we, we don't know how it works. And so uh, we all believe that uh, we are able to um, contextualize things, mm -hmm. right? Not only, do, not only do I know what that is sitting here on the table. Yeah, this mug. I, I know that that's a mug. Mm -hmm. I also know what it is for mm -hmm. and what it is not for. A computer would not know that. It might could recognize a, a, a mug, mm -hmm. but it, it can, I can never say, could I put an elephant in this mug? Obviously, we would yeah. say, that's ridiculous. No. <laughs> would it be common for me to put gasoline in this mug? No. That's <laughs> silly, right? I mean, not that you couldn't, but you wouldn't. Right, yeah. Um, or I could ask, what is this part of the mug for? Uh, and yeah. I know, the, right? That's an affordance for, for putting my hand to hold it. Mm -hmm. So I have all these contextual things and uh, these, these very high-powered computers do not have that. Mm. They do not have it yet. Is it possible for them to have it? I do not know. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think that there's anything limiting about something uh, processing information in silicon mm -hmm. with electricity that is different fundamentally from the biochemical processing that's happening in my, my skull right now. Mm. So I don't know that it's outside the realm of possibility, but we are mm. nowhere close to it yet. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not too worried. But if you want to be worried, <laughs> a really good book that I enjoyed quite a lot is called Super Intelligence okay. by, by a... Uh, philosopher uh, uh, Nick Bostrom, B O S T R O M, I think, from memory. Okay. Super intelligence, though. And uh, in it, he goes through the myriad ways that, that the computers will become so smart they will kill us all, <laughs> trying to help us, uh, and they will, they will murder us all because they think that's what we wanted. <laughs> so it's a really good book, though. I, uh, I don't, I don't, subscribe to the main thesis of it but it is very thought provoking and interesting mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm not i'm not too worried about all of that stuff okay uh, i i i want to uh i want a self-driving car just like everyone else i think it would mm -hmm. i think it would reduce traffic deaths to almost nothing right but the few that it the few that it caused would be all over the news and you would think yeah. it's the least safe thing Thirty thousand people die every year in the U.S. in car accidents, mm -hmm. if that was 300, but they were all caused because the computer driving the car, it, people mm -hmm. would be up in arms about it. Yeah, you've you've um, you've hit on a couple of things, um, which is mainly that computers basically get a bad rap because that's just how journalism works, and specifically science journalism, sure. where um, you. You, a journalist wouldn't go out to the street and say, you know, here I am standing in front of a street where no one died because they're all using self-driving cars. They only go to the places where people, where things, where bad stuff actually happens, right? Yes. Um, and I think that same, same idea is probably why um, computers are so, um, they're so demonized in our culture, I think, in, in some ways. They're almost like hmm. they're almost like a modern boogeyman, you know, like a, a, almost like a 21st century boogeyman in some ways. And I mean, it is a cultural thing, I, I, I know, because in Japan, for, for example, their representations of robots and that sort of thing are almost always very friendly and, and smiley and always helping people and um, but in the U.S., it's always HAL in 2001: A Space Odyssey. Right? Yes, the, the, HAL. The, the computers or, <laughs> or the Matrix, right? They're they're trying to kill us or mm -hmm. do bad things to us. Mm -hmm. um, that's true. I, I had not considered that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, th th that's a. 
that's not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, so I don't know what I would say to that. We, t we tend to be afraid of things... Um, this has nothing to do with computers, but if you will permit me... Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, vampires. Yeah. Lots of scary movies about vampires. Mm -hmm. And if I were to ask someone off the street, what do they know about... if what they would do if a vampire attacked them mm -hmm. or what hurts a vampire. They might be able to tell me a few things, right? The, the, the core things, like you can't be out in the sun, mm -hmm. stake through the heart maybe, mm -hmm. garlic or, or a crucifix, something like that. But uh, historically, there were bunches and bunches of things that they couldn't do. Mm -hmm. They couldn't cross over moving water. You have to oh. invite them in. Uh, it, it just a whole host of, of rules that they had to follow. And we've <laughs> lost those rules. But I think a lot of that is because those rules existed at a time when many people thought that they were real. And mm -hmm. you have to have a way to live your life in a world full of monsters and not... Mm -hmm. right. If you follow these rules, you will be safe from these monsters. And then, uh, now that we've kind of I don't think anybody reasonably believes in vampires anymore. <laughs> uh, so we can let most of those go. And we only keep the ones around that we, that we want to for storytelling purposes, but mm -hmm. not because uh, we need it to sleep well at night. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if it's similar with, with robots in the movies, right? They're, yeah. They're, they're fresh and, and we're scared of them. So we have all these rules. Can we control this thing? Mm -hmm. and, and it is very much the you know, uh, Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus thing, right? Yeah. What if you invent, what if you create this monster that you can no longer control? Mm. Um, uh, so, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Yeah. That I've, that I've spent literally two minutes thinking about. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. I mean, I was, I, I've thought about it a little bit because I, um, because I sometimes, I, I like to think about the, um, as someone who's interested in science journalism, I sometimes like to think about the failures of science journalism. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'll, some, I'll, I'll mention them as they come up in this podcast. Um, I guess I'm also taking, because I'm also interested in philosophy. So mm -hmm. I guess um, what I think you're drawing here with the example of the mug is just this, this difference that... Um, what we call in like the philosophy of the mind is like representation representational content i guess where i actually there's something going on in my mind but it actually has some content it actually it's actually referring to something in the real world whereas i'm not sure if a computer could or does have or will ever have any represent every any representational com content does that make sense it does i don't know if a computer could have yeah. that Clearly, you believe you have that. Right. How are you so different if I, if I wired things up uh, in an electrical system? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, I mean, a, a point could be made that there are billions of neurons in your brain with trillions of connections yeah. between them. Right. And how could I do that reasonably with, with a computer? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not right now, but maybe at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that a computer couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely we're not, we're not trying to get that either, though. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be the current arc in artificial intelligence. Okay. That thing that you were talking about mm -hmm. um, um, used to be called... Um, strong artificial intelligence mm -hmm. where you really are trying to think like a person would think mm -hmm. and uh, in in the modern world we, we're mostly concerned with uh, uses of artificial intelligence we mm -hmm. don't care that it really thinks like a person does and mm -hmm. can can note the context of the scene that's in front of it mm -hmm. and understand mm -hmm. it doesn't need to understand as long as it can faithfully predict things so Dr. Grothier might need a, a uh, machine learning uh, algorithm that can make predictions based on the data set that she's working with. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter that it understands the data. 
mm-hmm. at all, uh, not in the way that we would understand it. Mm-hmm. It just needs to say, given this is my data set, this is my prediction. Mm-hmm. And there you go. That's all that it needs. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think a part of your um, saying that, well, there are definitely a, l- a bunch of people who say that the human brain is a computer. Um, and I think you've, you've. I think it processes information. Right. Right. right yeah. And so I, I don't think that there's I don't know. Right. I, okay. I tend to believe that mm-hmm. there's no there's there's no um, obvious reason why I couldn't build something similar mm. if I had the scope. Right. And the and all of the information required. But Daniel Dennett has a, a another philosopher. He, mm-hmm. he has he has a book where he. Um, uh, makes the argument that there's something in living cells there there is intelligence in living cells from the ground up even Hmm. even single-celled organisms have intelligence they respond to their environments right they have they have proteins that that uh, uh, protrude through the cell membrane and when Mm -hmm. those proteins hit certain molecules they fold in a certain way and mm-hmm. that triggers other things inside the cell so that the behavior of the cell changes mm-hmm. i mean uh so he, his argument is maybe you have to have this from the ground up maybe you can't start it with dumb circuitry mm-hmm. maybe you have to have smart circuitry and you mm-hmm. might could wire that up into something that is also smart now a person mm-hmm. might say how do you get smart circuitry if i can't have smart circuitry if I have to have smart circuitry, I don't know yeah, what I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a really interesting question, um, and it's and it's because I'm taking like minds, bodies, and cells right now mm-hmm. in in philosophy, and so we've mentioned and all all this talk we've been having for about the past ten minutes now is about cognitive neuroscience, which is says that the brain and some cognitive neuroscientists have said that the brain literally is a computer, or that a computer could be. A computer in silicon could do what uh, a wet wear brain does, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's so interesting. I don't think we have the time for that. <laughs> we don't have nor, the time for that. Nor debate. do I have the expertise. No. <laughs> you really want to bring in a a neuroscientist, maybe, or uh-huh. a philosopher, mm-hmm. or both, mm-hmm. and they can speak to this. Uh, right. I can tell you how computers work. <laughs> yes. How how the human mind works, I do not know. Okay, uh, thank you. And um, also to, um, I, I linked uh, a video by Three Blue One Brown to Dr. Grother's episode, and it was an introduction to neural networks and computer learning. That's a learning. great video. Yes. And a great channel. Three yes. Blue One Brown is an amazing YouTube channel. Yes, it is. It is super good. I love the animations, mm-hmm. um, and you also. I'm sure you're a big fan of math, and you like the the content of that channel too. So I can't I can't recommend that video enough if you want to learn more about um, artificial intelligence from the ground up. Yeah. Um, this has been a great episode. Thank you so much again for being here, Dr. Course, Garrett. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening if you have been, and thank you for watching if you have been. <laughs>